This is Glambition Radio, episode number 223, with Sarah Fry, founder of Fry Farms. Ladies and gentlemen, Glambition Radio. Glambition Radio. Glambition Radio. Glambition Radio. Glambition Radio. Glambition Radio. Welcome to Glambition Radio. I am your host, Allie Brown. I'm an entrepreneur, mentor, investor, and founder of The Trust, the modern premier network for seven and eight figure women leaders. I love thinking big, doing different, and exploring ideas that disrupt the status quo, especially when it comes to women, because we are creating the new models for leadership, business success, making money, and changing the world. And hey, we're doing it with style. So let's go. Before I introduce today's guests, a quick reminder that this show is sponsored by The Trust, which is my new network for seven and eight figure female entrepreneurs. If you or another woman leader you know is craving a more powerful connection, more elevated conversation, and a modern platform for connecting with other high performing women globally, visit jointhetrust.org. We have some incredible events coming up, both live and virtual. Would be happy to tell you about it. And I would love to consider you if you are a good fit. Jointhetrust.org. If you're ready for something different, this is what you've been waiting for. Now, my guest today, Sarah Fry, is someone who, you know, you may not know who she is, but she actually owns the nation's leading producer of pumpkins. And she grows fresh fruits and vegetables in seven states. She's a new line of juices. That's all fine and good. But man, her new book, it's called The Growing Season. People send me books. You know, I I try to go through them ahead of time if I can. And uh, I opened hers and literally almost missed a meeting. The stories in there on how she grew up on a farm. She's actually the youngest of 21 children, including half brothers and sisters. She was born into poverty. They did not have heat in her home. I mean, one of those rough and tumble farmhood, you know, type of stories. And at 18, she took over her family's farm. She bought it from her father because she wanted to make something of it. And the story, it just brought me to tears. You are going to love this woman. And Sarah, thank you for the fresh juices you sent. They are unbelievable. I'm going to see how I can order more. The agua fresca, the watermelon, the strawberry. It's so beautiful. Just like her, she's a beautiful person with a beautiful soul. You're going to really love this story today. And some of the stories in the book, man, I was just cracking up. So you got to pick it up. It's called The Growing Season. And one quick shout out to two reviews my team picked up from me on Apple Podcasts. The first is from Meditating Dancer from the UK. How have I only just discovered you? Great mind fodder for successful women looking to upgrade and expand their success. Thank you. And... The next one is from Fort Gang, like Street Gang. I think I know who that is. Allie hits it out of the park. I just listened to the Christy Nickel episode after taking a break, and once again, it was the fastest 31 minutes of listening ever. Besides the firecracker guest, Allie asked all the right questions, the one I was asking in my head, and got to the core of what it takes for women in business to succeed. Now get ready for an adventurous conversation with Sarah Fry. Sarah, where are you right now? Hi, Allie. I am actually back on the hill. I am at the family farm that I grew up on in Southern Illinois, and I can't see my closest neighbor. So ironically, the place that I spent my entire childhood trying to escape is where I ended up, and it is now the escape. So I'm here at the farm, and um It's actually been a a, a great place to to ride out the storm, you know, with. Yeah. Are you taking guests? Because we'll we'll come, we'll show up. (laughs) We are absolutely (laughs) taking guests. You come anytime. You come anytime. So we're, and it's actually not hard to get here. And it's once you get here, there aren't a lot of, it's not like there's a Starbucks down the corner or, you know what I mean? Easy access to grocery stores and things. So yeah, let me know and come on out. I relate to your story because I'm a little part city mouse. 
and I'm a little part country mouse. You know yeah. what I mean? And mm-hmm. sometimes I watch Pioneer Woman and just fantasize. I'm on the farm with <laughs> with her. You know, just the the expansiveness and like how amazing that would feel to look out your window and just see land. Yeah, it just it must feel just beautiful. It's really, it is really quite beautiful here. And there's something to be said about living in the country. I mean, the air is fresher, it's lighter. I, it's almost, I, it's hard to describe. It's just, and then the colors are brighter and, you know, you don't have the pollution. It's just been an, it's an entirely different experience. Now, having said that, I'm very much town and country. I enjoy my time in cities and I enjoy my time traveling. But I also, I also yearn to get back to the country. And this is where I come back and, and recharge yeah. my batteries so that I can go back out into the world and do it all over again. I love it. Now, your, your initial plan was to get out of there. Okay, so oh. let, let's go back if we could start, because I think this is just fascinating on how this all began. And, and by the way, I've been reading, I want to share with you, actually, let me go back, your book. So I have a lot of guests with books. I usually get it, skim through it, you know, pick up what I need to pick up, but I don't have time to read the whole book for every guest. And yours, I, I open it and literally I almost missed a meeting. I start reading it and the stories in there. I mean, is someone going to make a movie of this? Because they could. Yeah. So the book has actually been optioned for film, but there will be more on that later. So in the coming weeks, we'll find out more about that. And it's going to be funny. I mean, there's some funny stories in there, but anyway, (laughs) let's go back. Yeah. So I grew up on this small farm in Southern Illinois with my four older brothers. We were, it was a very, very rural community in Southern Illinois, and we were very isolated from the rest of the world. So you you kind of put things into perspective. There was like one television channel that we had growing up and it was a WGN affiliate station and in order to watch TV on this tiny little black and white box one of the kids had to stand outside and like hold the antenna to (laughs) to beam the signal to the living room but we you know I mean we we didn't really even know that we were poor Allie because we were growing up on this 80 acre farm and Yes, was there really, really difficult times in our childhoods and was, you know, was it a very harsh way to grow up? Yes, but as much as it was tough, it was also really, I'm grateful for many of those experiences and the way we grew up and the sense of wonderment that I had as a child because of, you know, my freedom and ability to roam in nature and and use my imagination and, you know, create like these scenarios in, in my head to entertain myself, you know, whether it was like the hunting story with the chicken, when I accidentally killed that chicken <laughs> or, you know, whatever. I, I had this, it forced me to have this great big imagination growing up here in mm. the middle of nowhere on the, in this very, very rural part of, of the country. So it was, it was really actually quite amazing. And it's amazing that we actually all made it out alive because we had, you know, we, we were doing things as, you know, country kids that, you know, most adults wouldn't dream of doing, whereas, you know, taking risks, you know, are concerned. And it was, it was certainly an interesting upbringing here. And uh, like I said, I, I wouldn't change it for the world, but ironically, I had spent my whole life because I was, you know, I was the youngest, I was a girl. And then at some point, I realized how we were living wasn't normal and that there was more in the world. Mm. Like the first time I realized that people didn't have to chop, you know, firewood to keep themselves warm in the winter. I, I, I saw a thermostat for the first time when I was a tiny little girl when we were visiting friends of my parents and I saw this thermostat on the wall and I thought, oh my gosh, why don't we just get one of these little magic boxes so that we can be warm too? Like, why am I having to carry wood in? every every morning and every night to keep us warm. So, you know, as I started to understand that there was a big modern world out there, I was just, I craved more and more freedom. And then I wanted to, I spent much of my, you know, the majority of my youth planning my escape from this place. And, you know. What was the dream? What did you want? What was the fantasy? So the dream was, 
the dream was, I remember when I was very little, I went with my father to Chicago and we were driving down Michigan Avenue. And as much as I was in awe of the city, I was in, in awe of the women. You know, and I would see women walking down Michigan Avenue and some of the women would have on, you know, suits and heels and they would be, you know, have their, their briefcase. And some of the women were just, you know, out there dressed in normal street clothes, enjoying a, a, a beautiful day. And I was really in awe of the women more than I was even the city. And, and, and then I... Was it the power of it? Yeah, you know, I felt like I, I wondered what, like every woman that I saw, I thought, I wonder where she's going to work. I wonder what mm. she's going to do. Is she having a meeting? Is she going to lunch? And I wondered about their lives. And I thought, you know, this is what I want to be. You know, when I grow up, I want to wear, I want to wear the suit. I want to walk down Michigan Avenue. I want to go to, an, I want my office to be in one of these big high rise buildings with big windows and I'm going to work really hard and I'm going to do everything that I can do to get off of the farm so that I can be that woman and have that power. So I, you know, as a little girl, I was thinking I would be an, I'll be a great attorney someday. So I'm thinking in my head, you know, this, uh, so much time spent arguing with my brothers and <laughs> negotiating <laughs> Well, you know, do I want to be an attorney or maybe I'll go into business, whatever it was. But the, the dream was I will have a successful career and it will not, it, it will not be in Southern Illinois on the hill or anywhere yeah. near. And as soon yeah. as I can get out of here, I'm gone. And that's going to be me. There, there were a lot of stories in the book that kind of show the direction this all started to go in. But can you share with the listeners today, like, was there one pivotal moment that you realized I have to stay? Actually, this is going to be my next chapter. I'm I'm staying on the farm. Yeah. So, you know, as a as a young child, I I dealt with these feelings of isolation and fear on almost a daily basis. And as I was sort of planning my escape. I got very, very, very close to that moment. Like I could see my life when I was a teenager after I had, you know, I moved out when I was 15 years old. I'd taken control of my own life. I had started this business out of the back of a pickup truck selling melons, you know, <laughs> to grocery stores, but I was starting to feel my own power mm. and I had money. I could pay an electric bill. I could, you know, I could, I could buy myself clothes. I could eat the food that I wanted to eat. And I was working very hard to do that. And that was all just working toward the goal of getting out and getting on with my life. And there was a moment when I had this realization that sometimes getting ahead means that you have to stay behind. And that's when the end, you know, it was clear that the end of the family farm was, was very, very close. And I was having to, being the last kid left on the hill, my four older brothers, they had all escaped and they were off living in cities and going to college and getting on with their lives. And it was my turn, you know, it was my turn to leave too. But when, when I was faced with the finality of that decision that I would leave this land where we all grew up and we made such incredible memories and where we bonded together and where we survived together. I couldn't do it. I looked around after I walked the last horse off the farm and I knew in my gut and in every fiber of my being, everything that I had planned up until that moment went out the window, completely out the window. And it was like some other force had taken over my mind, my heart, my body, my soul. And I knew in every fiber of my being that I had to, I had to stay, that it was not, I couldn't run. I had to take a stand. And up until that moment, now, now that I'm older and I've had a chance to reflect on what happened? Like what gave you the confidence in that moment once you had that feeling and you started to reflect on the family and 
know, it was like a movie reel went off in my head of all of the memories that we had growing up on this small farm. I asked, you know, I've had the opportunity now, especially in writing the book, The Growing Season, to understand more about what prepared me for that moment. And those were the things, even the really difficult things that happened to me as a child, all of those things, having to stand up to someone who had abused me, you know, having my confidence built by, you know, my brothers and my father, when I, you know, I caught the, the, the fish in the pond that I didn't really catch that they, you know, they manufactured that whole event so that I thought I was the best fisherman in the world <laughs> and the rabbit, you know, that, that I shot. And so it was sort of a combination of all of those experiences, good and bad, that prepared me for that moment where you, you might think a young teen you know, who's thinking about that when they're a teenager? We're, we're all very selfish, right? When we're, when we're teenagers, for the most part, we're, we're thinking I, me, my, and not we, us, ours. Mm -hmm. But in that moment, I know that I was prepared to do what I did in taking a stand and deciding that I will save the family farm and I will bring my family back together and we will build something here out of this dirt because I was prepared for it, for all the good and all the bad that had happened to me in the years leading up to that moment. I think it, it probably took every one of those things to get me to the, to the place where I was able to feel the feeling that I felt and have the confidence to be able to, you know, take over and take a swing. So yeah, that was the moment that changed my life for sure. There's an undercurrent through even through your childhood and then into the stories you share as, as your career went on that you really, I don't know if you don't feel fear or you just, you, it didn't occur to you to let it stop you. Can we, can we talk about risk and fear and how you view them? Sure. I, it, well, it's not that I don't feel fear because I I'm human. I, I feel fear, but what I, I think what I do differently with fear is that, I almost get a little bit of a high off of it because I've learned to replicate the feeling that I had when I was very young of when I overcame fear, you know, whether it was standing up to someone, a grown man who had hurt me or whatever it was and having to take a stand that moment, you know, the throwing the turtle in the back of the truck, I was, I was terrified that the snapping turtle was, I mean, the thing was so big, it literally could have taken off my hand. I was seven years old. My father saying, you know, you grab that turtle by the tail and you throw that turtle in the truck, you know? And, and I'm like, are you kidding, right? <laughs> like, are you crazy? Yeah, you've lost it. Okay. These yeah, stories, I'm just yeah. dying. Like today, someone be calling social services. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, there's no question. You know, fear of being taken away by the Department of Children and Family Services. Like <laughs> my whole life. But I remember what I felt like after I overcame that fear. Like I would have never let, I was so mad at my dad for, you know, making me grab that turtle by the tail and throw that thing into the back of the pickup truck. But when I, once I realized that I wasn't missing a hand, I mean, I was like, it was like a rush. I felt mm. this extreme adrenaline that was like, oh my gosh, I did that. I mean, I'm very, I'm a very, very tiny girl at this point. And I've just done this really scary thing that I was just absolutely terrified of, but I, I overcame it. Right. And so in my adult life, I, it has been all of these moments where I've been afraid of something, but I've tackled it anyway. And then I, what I do is I just dial up that feeling that, you know, that, that rush of, I did this. I overcame it. I got through it. And you know what? It wasn't really that scary after all. I mean, we build up fear in our heads. We make things, you know, a thousand times worse than what they usually are. So I've just learned to, I've learned to manage it. And for me, fear is just another tool in the war chest. Yeah. I, th I think it was interesting to note too, that like, you know, you, when you, when you grew up with a life like that, you know, you're making survival decisions every day. You guys are eat, you're eating what you hunted and, and grew. And I mean, and then, so when you get into the space of where most women entrepreneurs are at, I mean, we're lucky to have our neuroses, right? If this is our biggest problem is believing in ourselves and being scared of a conversation, it kind of puts it into perspective. Right. Yeah. Oh, there, there's no question. Yeah. And I think, 
I think another thing that we suffer from is guilt. You know, I think women certainly suffer from guilt. Am I spending enough time building my career? Am I getting ahead the way that I should be getting ahead? Am I spending enough time with my children while I'm building my career? And it's, we're always sort of like questioning ourselves and say, you know, and, and at the end of the day, we're left with, you know, this enormous amount of guilt that just weighs heavily on us instead of saying, you know what, I, I, I'm not going, I'm going to buy the store-bought cupcakes and I'm dropping those off at the school because I'm busy and I have to get this meeting done and I'm not going to apologize for it because right now in this moment, I need to get this meeting done, Mm -hmm. you know, but I don't love my children less because this is, this happens to be the priority in, in this moment. And Hey, you know what? I have this presentation, but right now my children are the priority. I'm not going to feel guilty about the presentation. I'll get to that. But in this moment, I'm just going to enjoy the time with my children. And I won't yeah. feel the guilt. And I think as working mothers, like that's the biggest thing that we can shed. It would be like the guilt. Okay. Take the fear, turn it into a weaponize the fear and shed the guilt. That that's, I mean, yeah, I think you're right. Guilt is the next and final frontier. I think we're working through the fear. Like we've proven ourselves. A lot of us are out there. We're doing it. And then there's the lingering guilt, this little guilt linger, like, <laughs> and yeah. we in the pre-chat, I was talking about how we made, I, I just announced on Instagram, did kind of a rant about it. But I just said, okay, we're, we're doing the homeschool thing. We're pulling the kids out. This just isn't what we want for them. And it looks like it's going to be, you know, it could be a few months of this online stuff. It's just not what we want for them. So now I'm weighing with, okay, how do I manage the time here? How do I feel like I'm spending enough time? I mean, it's just always a non-ongoing little conversation in the head. Yeah. Always. Yeah. And I think, I think you, mm-hmm. I think once you make a decision and say, this is what, what I'm going to do, then you have to move on from that. Yeah. I made the decision and now I'm moving forward and, and don't second guess it. You know what I mean? Because yeah. ultimately, I mean, you have to, we also have to learn to trust our own instincts and not second guess. Oh, well, you know, I hope I made the right decision or, oh, this might be scary. What's going to happen? No, you know, make the decision and move forward. And don't give it any more of your, of your energy. Just make the best out of the decision that you made. Absolutely. And, and, every, and everyone does things differently too. You know, mm-hmm. it's important to, to remember. So, you know, I'm gathering information right now and I see some people who are really spending a lot of time with their kids and almost doing all themselves. I see others hiring help and, you know, everyone in the end makes, all you can do is make the best decisions for you. Absolutely. And you know, Ali, what you've done, it, what you've done with your life, is very similar to what I've done with my life. It, it is not a one size fits all solution. But what we've done that is the same as we don't necessarily have family and then career and then personal life over here. Like, it's all sort of in one bucket. and It's become a lifestyle. I think mm-hmm. about what I do for a living, whether it's whether it's growing thousands of acres of fruits and vegetables or making consumer packaged goods or, you know, leading this company or whatever I'm doing, that's all sort of still tied into the lifestyle that I created for myself. So my kids are involved in my, I don't shelter them from my business. My nieces, there are always people in and out of my house and all of these teenagers who are still very, very engaged in, you know, the business and and the life that I've sort of created. Mm. I didn't necessarily create a career for myself. I created a lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. I want to talk about, there's something that I read. I want to talk about your business acumen right now, because that that's really what, I don't want to use the word, I don't want to say surprised, but it was just refreshing to see from someone like you and the, I mean, the, the ballsy, I can't think of just a better word right now, just the ballsy moves you made so much that Harvard Business School used you as a case study for, for your negotiations with Walmart. Were you like, are you serious? Did they call you and say, we want to use you as a case study? You're like, what? I've actually done several for Harvard on negotiation. We just completed another round of studies last summer that will be published soon. But yeah, you know, it's interesting because I, I'm not classically educated. I wasn't classically trained in a, in a big corporation. I, I didn't get my MBA, although I have several MBAs that work with my company. I hire them. Mm-hmm. My life experience, everything happened so quickly for me from the time I was a little girl and everything that I went through. 
And in that process of knowing like, oh, gee, I want to get off of the hill. There were things that I felt like I had to do so quickly. So I attended high school and college simultaneously. I went to a junior college at night. So if you think about where I grew up, wow. the closest school, is, it's, a, it's a junior college. It's called Frontier. And I actually started taking classes there, you know, night classes. I had a pretty full schedule even while I worked when I was a junior in high school, not because I just loved school, you know, and I'm like, oh, sign me up for more of this. I love it because I actually hated being trapped in a classroom, but I wanted to get it done because I felt like I have to check this box. This is a box that I have to check Hmm. ultimately for, for my freedom. And I had watched my four older brothers. I mean, they got off the farm. One thing I do have to credit my, you know, my father had a seventh grade education, but one thing I have to give him credit for is the emphasis that he put on a higher education. Mm -hmm. And he knew that he wanted a better life for his, his own children. And so everyone in my family went to college, but I was really the one who was expected like, okay, she's going to, she's really going to go to college and she's going to, you know, had this fantastic career. And then, you know, when the moment came that I wouldn't be going on to a major university or following my, my brother who was working on his doctorate at, at U of I, and when I said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing it right now. I can't because this is my priority. I'm going to save the family farm and I'm building this business. And ultimately, you will all see the value in, in, in what I'm creating. So, I feel like, I mean, so much of what I learned, you know, I can't tell you what I, what I learned. And even in just the two short years at the small college, I mean, not that the classes weren't good or that the teachers weren't good. They were fantastic. They were very caring. It was a small college with a big heart, but I really was self-taught. And then I surrounded myself with people who were smarter than me, frankly, and, and people who you know, had higher education. And there's been times though you weren't like when you, the Walmart story, can you, can you walk us through that? Because I actually haven't heard that one. And would you mind just walking us through why that deal was so great and people use that now to look at as a case study? Yeah. um, That was a particular negotiation that I did on pricing. So I'm in this business of commodities, right? You can only make melons, you know, so sexy (laughs) at the end of the day, (laughs) the stuff in the produce department. I mean, a melon's a melon, an apple's an apple, you know, branding isn't, although we're changing that, but branding has never really been something that would set pieces Mm -hmm. of fruit apart. So it's a commodities business. And Ultimately, I understood the business because I had been working in it since I was a little girl. I understood the markets and how things work. And the study was about a market situation and then also how a small company like Fry Farms at the time could negotiate its way to becoming back then what was known as a co-managed supplier for Walmart. So that meant you kind of had a little more control over your product's destiny. You could cut the purchase orders yourself. You had access to their systems. You could manage the inventories. Mm. You were booking the trucks anyway, so you could schedule all of the appointments. You could, you know, if a truck wasn't going to arrive, you were able to go in, pull a purchase order out of delivered status and move it off a day or two. So you had a lot more flexibility in, in your business. And many of the large companies that Walmart gave that technology to and that access to their systems to Ultimately, co-man- what they did then was they co-managed small suppliers like me, which sort of set up a firewall between my company, a small company, mm. and Walmart, this large company. So I started to be- become invisible. Walmart said, okay, we're going to have these co-managed suppliers. And here, you know, Sarah, meet the five different companies that are going to manage your seven items that you sell us. Mm. And I remember thinking, oh, no, 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 no this is not going to be good. I want to have the direct relationship with my customer. I want to be able to, you know, manage my business. And I don't want to leave that up to someone else, even though they're, you know, a company that's a hundred times the size of mine. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking this would be a good way, honestly, (laughs) to get rid of your competition, right? So if you were one of these larger companies 
and you didn't want to fry farms in, in the mix or you didn't want a, a farmer X, Y, Z in the mix, you would just slowly start to starve off their business. So yeah. for me, I thought, oh, no, 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 no. I was very much used to controlling my own destiny. And I knew that that would be over time be devastating to my business. So the first negotiation study that Harvard did was about how I negotiated my way into co-management status, which ultimately allowed us to grow in a partnership with Walmart and be visible to them. You know, we wanted, these were the people, I mean, if you think about how I started my business with them, I started delivering to their division one stores when I was, I don't know, 16, 17 years old. I was about pickup truck, right? So Walmart associates were coming outside to help me unload melons or pumpkins. And, you know, I sort of felt like I was part of the Walmart family. I mean, these were ordinary people. And at this time when Walmart was expanding, these ordinary people were beginning to do really extraordinary things and growing and expanding that business. And I had very much felt a part of that. And then when I started doing business with them as a very, very young woman, before I was gosh, before I was even 12, I was like 19 and negotiating bigger national type produce deals. I felt like I was just as invested in them as they were in me. And I didn't, I didn't want a firewall put up between us as like another company, like, okay, now another company is going to be the middleman between you and your customer. Has a lot of your negotiation over time been simply having the guts to ask for what you think you deserve? Could it be that simple? Oh, there's no question. And, and, but it's also about how and when you ask for what you know you deserve or what you believe you deserve. Timing has a lot to do with that. And it's being able to recognize different opportunities. Like I've never, and I have my mother to really credit for this because on that summer, in that summer delivery route, you know, there were always times when she would say to me, you know, I had to pay the farmer so much more money for these melons and you know, so-and-so doesn't want to pay more at the store. So-and-so doesn't want to pay more at that store. And if you remember, I was eight years old and, and she would pull in front of a grocery store and it was my job to go in and talk to the produce manager, make the sale, take the huh. order, walk through the store, meet her in the back of the store, the loading dock, where we would unload the cantaloupes or watermelons, whatever it was that we had. And then I would push that cart back up to the front of the store. I'd write the ticket out for the produce manager. He'd sign it. I'd go to the front office, get the cash, boom, come run out the front of the grocery <laughs> store and jump in a moving truck. Okay. I was doing that. Like my first sale was when I was eight and that was, I loved it. So I was used to asking for more money when I was a very young girl, simply because there were times when we had to pay the farmer more money for the fruit. And yeah. You know, but what I learned when I was very young, and I give this example, my mom, she was hot and sweaty and we're driving this old truck and, you know, I mean, her life was very difficult. So, (laughs) you know, oftentimes I was on the, the receiving end of, you know, how things were going with her. But, you know, in her defense, she had a very tough job as a mother and as a, you know, someone just trying to make it and scrap every day. And she had told me that I needed to ask for more money from this particular produce manager. And so I said, okay, all right. So I get out of the, I get out of the car to go in the grocery store to make the sale. But I realized on my way to find the produce manager, I walked through the produce department. I realized that they have a lot of cantaloupes there already that they haven't sold them all. And Mm -hmm. so when I find the manager, I know it's not the right time to ask for more money. He's going to buy cantaloupes today, maybe a few, but I can't charge him more money today because he has a lot that he still has an inventory to sell through. Yeah. So I don't make the ask for more money. And then I go back out to the truck and my mom's really upset with me. She says to me in this very gruff, how much did you get out of him? And I'm like, uh, <laughs> you know, sorry, uh, nothing, no more. And she was very upset with me in that moment. But I told her, I said, you know what, don't worry about it. You know, we're ultimately going to get more for these melons today. And so at the next store I go in and the produce manager's so excited to see me. And I'm like this tiny little person walking in, like, you know, 
hey, Bob, how many cantaloupes do you need today? Mom's out back with the truck. And, and, but I notice as I have the luxury, now she's, she's outside in a hot truck and I have the luxury of strolling through an air conditioned store, checking out their inventory to see what they have. And he was down to like one or two cantaloupes. So mm-hmm. I knew that he needed the press. So there was a need. And then it went off in my head. He needs, I know that he needs this. He's excited. Yeah, let's dial it up. Now, right. but now's the time to ask for more. So when I, when I say that, you know, when the timing, timing's right, you know, there are things that factor into that timing when asking for more money and, and, and identifying the need. Once you identify the need and in, in that moment, that's when it's best to ask. My gosh, you learn so much at a young age. I just think yeah. these skills are being lost now. These kids don't learn anything at school. And I mean, just what, what an amazing, I think I needed to hear you today too, because as, you know, as I'm going on this journey now with my kids, you realize how much of like your work and life is how they learn, like being yeah. around that. And you were, Absolutely. you were, you were negotiating <laughs> like eight years old. This is, yep. it's amazing. There's no question. There's no question, Allie. And I've tried to do that with my own boys. And I haven't sheltered them from the good times or the bad. Mm-hmm. And when, when COVID hit, it really impacted our business too. I yeah. was going to ask you about that next, if you don't mind sharing. I mean, so many things this year, there's been supply chain disruption. I know that a lot of your, I'm going to guess a lot of your work depends on visa work, people coming in. I I don't even know. I I just would love to hear if you could be frank, you know, with how you've navigated through this year. Absolutely. You know, most of our business was heavily weighted grocery retail on the fresh side. So all of the fresh fruits and vegetables, most of the fresh fruits and vegetables ended up in grocery retail. But we also have restaurant business and, and a big restaurant business. So I'm fortunate enough to be, you know, a supplier in the food service industry. For instance, Subway is one of our big customers, great customers, just mm. very committed partnership. And they sell my beverages, my watermelon, agua fresca in their stores. And when, when all of these franchisees were forced to shut down their stores, our business died and, you know, we were left with, we had millions of dollars worth of inventory and product, you know, that was on a shipping site Mm. that died overnight. And um, that was scary, but we also had this crop that we were getting ready to harvest in South Florida. It was just the beginning, the tip of the domestic shipping season on melons and melons are actually a big part of our business. And I, you know, I started waking up every morning was a, just a new, a new disaster, like one right after another. So, you know, we had the import fruit at the time that had flooded our market from Mexico. And even though we had, you know, domestically produced watermelons available out of Florida in April, our market was awful because we were still getting flooded with, with imported fruit at the time. So it was like, okay, how do you, all right, you know, we got to deal with the markets and then are people even going to want to buy melons and do people think fresh produce is safe? So then I had to spend time educating people on, yes, it's safe, it's safe to eat. We're taking, you know, America has the safest food supply in the world. You know, that would be like one call and one interview. And then, and then, you know, the next telephone call that I would have would be, you know, with my director of food safety, okay, what's the plan and what's the protocol for keeping the workers safe? You know, have we implemented temp checks? Are we giving them the proper PPE? If you remember that time, like there was no PPE. Now, fortunately, we were also in the manufacturing business. So we had a lot of PPE on hand because Mm. we were making juice. So we Mm -hmm. took that PPE and shipped it to the farm and said, okay, so here's the PPE for the workers who are going to be working in the farm because the juice room wasn't running at that time. So we were able to, you know, but it was like every five minutes, the world was blowing up and we use, obviously we rely heavily on H2A guest workers to come in and to help us harvest the crops. And it was scary because there was a moment when, you know, Hey, the border's going to get shut down. Oh, okay. <laughs> Wait, we still have to feed people. Like if you shut down the border and you don't let these guest workers cross the same people who've been coming to work for the company for the past 16, 18 years to pick the melons that, you know, come here, they perform their job they they have their visas, they have their work permits, and then they return to their home country after 10 months. 
if you don't let them in, we're not going to be able to pick the food that we need to mm-hmm. feed the people who are freaking out right now. So, you know, I had to engage with the congressional leaders at that point. And ultimately decisions, I have to give this administration credit when all of that was going on, they responded very quickly to mm-hmm. those needs. And we were able to get the workers that we needed. But my kids watched every day as I went through just one battle right after another. They were here doing their online learning, but I'm walking around in my house with my headphones in and they're, they're hearing the stress, the tension, and I'm not sheltering them from any of these difficult calls, no matter who I'm on the phone with. Yeah. And so they said one day, my son William says to me, he says, mom, I want to call. And I said, yeah, oh, okay, son, that's nice. That's nice. You want to help. And I'm thinking, okay, they're kids, right? You know, they're, my boys are 14 and William was 15 at the time. They're 18 months apart. And I thought, oh, isn't that, you yeah, know, that's nice. He, he cares about his mom. So I'm like, okay, okay, yeah, that's nice. I'll, I'll, I'll figure something out, uh, a way for you to help. But they kept asking and asking. And finally, one day, I kind of got a little short with them. And I said, you know what you can do? And this is over the import melon market. I said, you know what you could do for me? I'll tell you what you could do for me, son. You could sell some watermelons. How about that? Can you do that? Can you sell some watermelons? <laughs> You're kind of being flippant with them. Yes, I was being yeah. flippant and almost a little sarcastic. Like you have no idea what's going on in my world right now. And you keep badgering me about what you can do because you're, <laughs> you're bored with your e-learning, you know? <laughs> it's, it's okay. Every mom has their, there's a line yeah. and then you just go there. Yeah. And- I kind of crossed that line. But then I, but then after I said it, I thought, you know, I should give him some melons to sell out here at the farm. Now, keep in mind, I'm in Southern Illinois. This is April. It's still cold. We're 30 minutes from the nearest population center of like 5,000 people, right? I'm going to give him these melons and they're not really going to sell them, but that's going to give him and my little nieces, Anna and Audrey, and my two boys, Mom, Luke, it's going to give them something to do on Easter weekend. And okay, it's Easter. I'm going to bring melons in let them have this cute little sale, right? And so they set everything up. I bring up a load of semi-load of our watermelons from Florida and I let them set up their stand over at the farm inside the uh, packing facility. And they put it on Facebook that, hey, we have our Fry Farms watermelons from you know South Florida, come and get them this Easter weekend. They made this cute little ad with the Easter bunny and said, you know, no one could go to church at that time and, and gather. So it was kind of this like little bright spot. They put it on Facebook, but it got shared like 200 and some times, right? Hmm. So I go over there on a Saturday morning while they're setting up for their sale. And I thought, oh, isn't that cute? They're taking the melons out. They're, they're making their display look perfect, right? And they've got about 150 watermelons set up on this little wooden thing that they built. But then I notice all these cars start to line up. Allie, I swear to you, the line was two miles long Mm. to get into their melon sale. And they sold a full semi-load of nearly 3,000 watermelons in less than five hours. Oh, my gosh. I had to start working, helping them load cars. I mean, they had on all their face mask gear. They had on gloves. They had all the sanitation stuff. And we were just loading cars, one right after another. And people were buying these melons, like 5, 10, 15, 20 melons at a time, because they were sharing the melons with their neighbors as Easter eggs. They were dropping off watermelons to people who were afraid to get out of their homes and go to grocery stores. The kids were selling these melons for $5 a piece. It's like what, like carload after carload. And so my brother John's there and he jumps in. His girls are there. You know, they, they did the sale with my boys. And we're looking at each other like, holy crap. Like, and we're having to work. Like, I'm sweating <laughs> on that Saturday before Easter. And I think, oh my gosh, we have to get more melons. And I had to bring them another semi load because they did not have, any, they ran out of wow. water melons and they did not have enough to meet all of their customer demands. And yeah. they showed me, I learned from them. Like, I learned from my kids during COVID. And they showed me their own entrepreneurial spirit. And they showed me really what it meant to do direct consumer marketing. And that you, even though you had a farm and you you were growing these commodities, 
there's a way to reach consumers directly with these products and people actually do care and they care about where their food comes. They care about it, where it's raised. We, you know, we care about mm -hmm. where things are manufactured in this country. And I, it was, it was really incredible to me. So I love that story. What yeah. a bright, what a bright spot in the middle of all. It must've just reminded you why you're doing what you do. It did. And you know, they kept it up and every Saturday now they have, they have their Saturday sale and those four little kids go over there and run it. And Willis since turned 16. And you know, what really made me proud too, was they reached out to other growers who were having challenges, who had lost their markets because they were heavily weighted in the restaurant industry. So whether mm. it was, you know, they brought in berries from a grower who, who had strawberries and blueberries they brought in peaches. They brought in all of these other products that they could sell through their drive through because by now they have this following. And sometimes people were, I mean, people were waiting in their car for like an hour just to get into the kids' drive through I mean, I'm talking, we have drone footage of these cars lined up for miles. Uh, it was such a field of dreams moment. Oh my and gosh. so they kept it up every Saturday and then they... They brought in products from other farms from around the country, from other growers who were, who were struggling with their business, who had this food, but no, no way to get it to a market. Yeah. Before I ask my final question, you know, what do you, what do you hope most people take away from your book, The Growing Season? You know, I thought about the higher purpose for this book as I wrote it. And throughout the entire process, and there were many times when I wanted to give up and I thought, why am I sharing all of this crazy stuff about my life? Why am I going to put myself through this and put myself out there? But I had this nagging feeling that there is a higher purpose for this. You don't understand it now. You can't articulate it now, but you need to keep writing. So I did. And I truly believe that there isn't a better moment for the growing season because of the time that we're living in. Because I think what the book will do is provide hope to people and it will provide the strength to know that you can overcome feelings of isolation, of fear. And no matter how hard or, you know, no matter how hard things get, you can overcome. And I really believe the book's gonna provide a lot of much needed hope right now and really inspire. The book is for everyone. And I think about the young women. I mean, when I, I envision who I see reading this book and who I hope this book will touch, you know, I envision a young woman, you know, a young girl growing up in rural poverty or herself, but there's so much in it. The stories are so rich. I think that the stories aren't, are no longer mine. They belong to the world. And I think that no matter who you are, there's something in this book that will inspire you to actually make a real and meaningful change in your life. So yeah, yeah, that's my, that's my hope for the growing season. The growing season and everybody could pick it up on Amazon, anywhere else you want to promote? Walmart, Walmart will have it as well. You can pre-order it at walmart.com. You can pre-order it on Amazon and it will be out on August 25th. Oh my gosh, it's so exciting. To wrap up, oh my gosh, I feel like we could do a whole other part two of this, but we do have to wrap up today. So Sarah, last three pieces of advice for everyone listening. Three pieces of advice. I would say, I would say we covered some of that advice and that was, you know, I mean, I'd start with the fear and really learn how to not just overcome fear, but how to utilize that feeling that you have once you have overcome fear and ultimately replicate that in your life and, and moving forward. And the other thing would be, you know, guilt. As working moms, we really have to shed the guilt. And once we, we master that, we've really set ourselves free. And there isn't anything that can stop us, no matter what we want to do. And then I think lastly, I would just just, you know, just own it and be yourself and don't, don't apologize for who you are, or where, where you've been, where you came from. For me, my whole life, it was so much easier as I was building my business to let people make assumptions that, oh, you know what? Oh, isn't that nice? She's a farmer. Her dad gave her that business. It was so much easier for me to just allow people to believe what they wanted to believe. 
And it mm-hmm. started off as, oh, that, yeah, she came from a middle income family, you know, that it was, oh, her family must have been wealthy and her dad gave her this business. I allowed people, you know, to believe that about me to the point where, not that you have to go correct everyone, because you certainly don't, you, you wouldn't want to waste your time doing that. But to the point where at one point in my life, I'm like, who, who am I really? I mean, I know my truth and I know where I came from and I know what I went through to get here, but I had to own that and own the power that was in those stories. So, you know, my last piece of advice would be make no apologies, own your power and just be who you are. And there's no need to apologize for it. The world is hungry right now for authenticity. And, you know, it was really scary writing this book and and opening up my life and, and experiences to the world. But I can also tell you this, it was so liberating too. And I'm finally at that moment where I'm like, okay, I'm free. Mm. Yeah, it is personal. I mean, I opened up like, and, and landed on a few passages. I'm like, whoa, you know, <laughs> I wasn't, I was expecting like business advice from the farm and uh, it's very personal and just such a, just thank you. Thank you for writing it. Thank you for opening up so much. Thank you for being who you are because we need such different types of stories. We need to hear from different types of women and, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. And I hope to buy some of your pumpkins or melons or yummy juice one day. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully you'll get that opportunity and I'm happy to send you some samples, Ellie. Please. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Sarah. All right. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Glambition Radio. <laughs> If you enjoy the show, make sure you subscribe so you automatically get my new shows every week. Also, I'd love if you left us a review so more women like you can discover us. We're on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Pandora, and other major platforms. And I'd love to hear from you personally. Come join the conversation on social. Instagram is my happy place lately, and that's Allie Brown Official. But you can find links to my other platforms at AllieBrown.com. Glambition Radio is the elevated conversation for women leaders, and I'm honored you tuned in.